But as you remember, the idea was uh, I want to give a lecture series about uh, the moment where I consider were similar to the, what we spoke about, where the author, you know, the relationship between architecture and the city, yeah, became in such a thing that you could argue it's not anymore the architect that defined what the city should look like, yeah, but basically there came the idea what the city in certain way becomes the author to architecture. If this is true, which is a strange word, because how can the city become an author? But at least you could say, suddenly the thing that was larger than architecture became the viewpoint. Yeah? And to some of you, when we spoke about the studio, and they came up with the idea, for example, I see Cecilia with the idea of, uh, of Aldo Rossi. For example, you could see in Aldo Rossi, you know, there was an idea about the city that suddenly had a determinant of architecture. Okay. So that's why uh, the argument could be that this kind of lecture theory could also be called the postmodern theories or urban theories. And these are the kind of eight, uh, what was it, 10 lectures I thought I give you this semester. As you can see, the first lecture is one of the day, which in principle is much more actually the context, yeah? Uh, or kind of a short running between 5,000 years of history so that we come to the last 50 years, yeah? So it's in principle, it's on the background in which the all the eight books are presented, yeah? Okay? So this is the, the three little decks, yeah, that I thought I'd give you, yeah, which are in principle the reference that we spoke about, but by the death of the author, you know, we, this is a thing what we do in the studio, is basically also related to the idea that what if suddenly the reader becomes the author, and then if you translate that into architecture, what if the city becomes the author of architecture, because the city is basically the reader in that sense of its architecture, okay? So this was the summary. So these are the, the, then this is the book we are going to present, and this is basically the lectures that we are going to do, okay? Okay, so what I thought I'd do as the first lecture yeah, is giving you, <clears throat> and I assume now that no one of you had, uh, I mean, I don't know where you come from, I assume that you come from uh, architecture backgrounds. I don't know how you have been taught architecture, at least, um, um, I'd say I have not been taught an urban history through architecture. It came more uh, that I moved to the Netherlands, which is a culture in which the city more or less becomes uh, became a culture project for architecture. That I suddenly realized that basic that uh, is something like a history uh, of the city as such to which you can then relate architecture. Yeah? Now, most of them are of course also hit Italians, yeah? and so one of, and, and so sorry that I have it only the German book. And so this is one book that I always use, yeah? and which I only recommend if you want to have it. It's a really, let's say, very uh, simple uh, overview of the history of the city. Yeah? What it means by that as a history of the city is, it is a history which you could call, you could call it's a Marxist or materialist history. Yeah? What it means is it's a history written from the viewpoint yeah, that when each time something materially changed, you know, this is when someone asked me today, you know, uh, you know, when you ask me, are we still in postmodernism? Then you could argue it from a materialist point of view only if the material environment radically changes the means of production, then also the social environment and also the means of architecture change. So historical materialism in a certain Marxist means, means is once the means of production are changing, then the social structure is changing and with the social structure it's aesthetic and so on. Yeah? And so the reading of this guy's book is saying that each time there was a shift, more or less in agriculture or in the material uh, understanding of the world, it each time produced a new kind of city, okay? And so what I thought with you is, these are the chapters uh, I realized called, how I, know, I don't know how I'm going to make this in, uh, in, not, in less than half a day, yeah? but these are all the chapters, yeah? And so all the chapters of the book are, and as you can see, until the modern city. And when you look at it, 
then you can say that uh, he debates more or less all the ideas that we can refer to cities. Now, just to be clear, uh, I think there is one chapter that I have taken. No, so he takes about the Far East city. He talks about the Greek city, the Roman Empire, the Islamic city, you know, the Middle Ages. So what I try to do is I just catch them slightly as an idea, yeah. And of course, if you want, we can once debate on this longer. What's the, what's the reason? Or you can you can read that, yeah. Uh, the good thing of the book, what I am showing to you is. The texts are very small, but it has a lot of images that explains it. Yeah, yeah. So, in order to understand the beginning, um, this is, I think, where we can somehow argue where it started. Yeah. So, if the human species yeah, is on this planet around a million years, yeah. Oh, I think this is what the you know, Homo sapiens came later, but the human species is longer. You can argue that the only reason why we have cities is because around 10,000 something changed materially on this planet, and that was that the last ice age, you know, ice age five. Yeah? Yeah. So ice age, this is the movie, yeah, ice age, yeah. <laughs> ice age moved back, yeah. So basically the ice, the, the, the planet became warmer, yeah, ice moved back. And with the back movement of the ice, certain area of this planet became very fruitful in terms of architecture production. Yeah, because you have to understand, uh, 500,000 as a hundred, more million years ago, you know, you could argue 95% of our time on this planet, we were just shooting around, hunting, you know, like a, a you know, like a football team, you know, Mr. Quarterback in front of him, the big guys defending him, you know, and some others, you know, collecting the foods, you know. But anyhow, we were like little nomads, yeah, hunting around, you know, yeah. But then you could say around 30,000 for Christ, you know, we already, we already said, okay, let's, let's have a little village over here, you know, let's do some planting, you know, but it was still a, it was still a, a big mess, yeah. But you could say the real radical, so the idea of agriculture started already a little bit before, but the real explosion in the idea of the overproduction of uh, Agriculture, fruitful land started around uh, 10,000 for Christ. So what you can see, and here is to our friends, uh, more or less from the uh, Middle East, in principle it was the Middle East yeah, that became the most fruitful area. It had to do with the Nile Delta, it had to do with the Euphrates and Degris, it had to do with these rivers yeah, that became enormously fruitful. And so what happened now is in the origination of the city that you understand is that once this material radically changes happened, there was such an overproduction yeah, of, um, how do you say, um, uh, overproduction of, uh, uh, yeah, how do you say, uh, veg vegetation that not anymore, anymore needed to work, okay? Not only that, it needed suddenly a powerful organization to orchestrate that kind of overproduction, yeah? And that's where you suddenly have the emergence of the ideas of kingdoms or the idea of feudal heroes, yeah? because suddenly you needed an, a very, very hierarchical organization that basically orchestrated that production. Yeah? And in order to do this, this hierarchical organization needed a city, yeah? because the city became the political form for this kind of environment. Yeah? And that's why you see, for example, the emergence of Ur, or Uruk yeah? in Iraq, yeah? which suddenly has the idea there is an, emp a pow an emperor, or someone who has the power, then the city becomes a wall where all these people used to live. The countryside was that where it was produced and the city became a political form to organize that work. Yeah? And then, uh, as you can see in the origin, you had three kind of powers. You had the emperor as a power, then you had the uh, um, the religion, and then you had the people. And what you can see is, is that it's a diagram that I think was interesting when I was in Iran, that you still found it again. It's actually a city built out of walls, 
a wall within a wall within a wall. Yeah, you can see the first wall is the Sikorat, the next wall is the is the uh, religious center, and the next wall is the people's thing. So the, the, the key diagram that to which all of these cities have been made is basically seen by this uh, mandala where you have a crossing of two kind of ideas of infrastructure and then you see the segmentation of the emergence of different labors yeah, to which each of them becomes a city. Because what the city does, and this is through the means of overproduction, yeah, and since not everyone anymore was related to get the f to work on the field, there became a differentiation in the society because suddenly some people didn't need to go. They, can sudden, they could suddenly make sculptures, they could suddenly make art, they could suddenly make, make certain kind of pieces. Yeah? So the city in itself is each time, because of its overproduction, also the means of differentiating a society yeah, for which other people and other professions emerge. So that's why, for example, if you go in a village, you will only have one hairdresser, but if you go in the city, you would have one for beautiful yellow colors, blue colors, silver, curly, check, you know, because the difference <laughs> Because the differentiation yeah, of the city f allows you to basically produce variety. That's why the city, and this is what the Lefebvre and stuff and is, it's a differentiation machine. It produces each time differences. Yeah? So here, for example, another uh, Babylon, where you can see the diagram emerging, the river goes through, then you have the wall, and the wall, the wall became now suddenly the political boundary, yeah, to which basically this uh, society was orchestrated, and as a nice example here in Shiraz, yeah, where you can see now, in principle, that the houses and the courtyards and the things came together, yeah. Or, for example, in Egypt, yeah, where you suddenly have the uh, the temples of the gods versus the temples uh, of the people. So we can suddenly see that the emperor, but the, the, you needed the pharaoh yeah, in order to have someone who becomes in power to basically orchestrate that whole kind of overproduction. Here are some images about uh, the living condition. So what now happened in the city of the Far East, yeah, which is the other story, is that you could see the city of the Far East had a slightly uh, different idea. Even when the diagram was the same, there was always a different relationship uh, between the North and the South. So for example, uh, if you think about this in China, and this is a very, this is the famous diagram of the Chinese relationship between the mountain and the sea, you suddenly see there was a, uh, an idea that the city was embedded, you know, in something that was the, the rough landscape in the north and the south landscape in the rough. So it was not anymore a kind of amorphic circle. It was in that sense the idea of a wall, but you could see it was a very similar diagram. This is, for example, uh, Chinese uh, cities, and, for, and please forgive me for some of you that are from these particular countries, you know about this history much more. I mean, I'm just showing you a kind of roughly overview that the diagram of the city in that sense was the same, yeah? It each time only had a different articulation, yeah? But in here, it was the square, and so for example, if you think about Beijing, the inner thing is the forbidden, uh, here for example, Beijing, the inner city is the forbidden city, then the next ring is the next ring, and then the third is the other city. So these were, for example, you could say the first kind of cities that rearranged by the means of agriculture, yeah, and always needed to have an emperor that more or less started to become this political form. Then you could say what in Western Europe, or what becomes now in two, around 2,500 or 3,000, a new kind of city, is a Greek city. Two things are happening. There's a new material change happening because of the production of, um, uh, of metal. So the discovery of metal yeah, allowed suddenly to produce other kind of material goods. Yeah? And with these material goods, you could change suddenly and reproduce the agriculture and so on. Now what did now the Greek city um, was doing, and why I think the Greek city in a certain way is um, a main part of some of these lectures is because you have to understand for, for you that come from different cities, the Greek city is basically 
you could argue the uh, the base for uh, many of the European diagrams of the cities. Now here you can see a sketch by Le Corbusier. So he understood the city as actually two ideas of cities. Yeah, he was the city of the mountain and the city of the uh, of the land, the city of the religion on the top, and the city of the uh, people below. And the diagram, of course, of that city was in principle the idea of the emergence of the single, single public building floating in an in a empty landscape. So here you see a diagram uh, of, the, of the Greek city. You had the Acropolis, which was the religious city, and then you had the public city below. Hmm? So what is now interesting here, and that's why I think uh, uh, we can talk about this later, is there's one function that has, is radically new, that doesn't exist in any of the cities before, and that is in principle the Greek theater. Yeah? Now why there is such an idea about public space, or the idea that we call public, is because the Greek city produced a space that was not existing before, yeah? And that is the agglomeration of the collective of the city unified in one space. Yeah? Because you have to imagine the, the Far East city, the, the, the Middle East city, and so on, they have all the same function, which means there was the religion, yeah? which was uh, the uh, uh, basically the, 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 the beliefs, there was the power, it was also clear, and there was the market, which was basically the bazaar. Yeah, in the in the Middle East and in 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 here in the Greek in the Greek city it was the forum. But what a Greek city had was the theater. Okay? And so the theater was the space in which the first time you produced something that represented not only the collective. It, ah, here's, ah, here's my expert over there. Uh, don't uh, don't hit me when I say something wrong. Even the Egyptian had another place which was called the Sphinx, yeah? which was where you basically met collectively and voted. But what you have to imagine is what the Greeks now did, and which no one did before, at least not in the Western country, is they were producing what you could call the idea of culture because through the reason that they, I think they decide, they, I heard some, I read somewhere that they did 1,300 theater plays per year which means it was a cultural thing for the collective. It was not anymore a necessity that deals with the, with the pure form of existence of the species. It produced a culture to which basically the collective is represented. And so the same thing then is the Agora. The Agora was not only a place uh, for the market, yeah, but it was also a place where all these collection uh, or all these people could meet or debate or whatever. I show you only the diagram because what is now interesting in architectural terms, and you will see that very differently, the big difference between uh, and Isla, I mean, uh, between, to my knowledge, the Islamic city and the idea of the, or basically the Fai city and the idea of the of the Greek city was that if you want to enter into the public space, yeah, you had to go, and this is what I was interesting when I was in 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 Esfahan, yeah, you always had to go uh, through a building into a space. The idea of the Greek city is the first time that the street, basically the space of circulation, moves into the public space. So there is a continuity between what is the space of circulation versus the space of collective meeting. Yeah? It's, a, it's politically, just to no, know, it's a totally different idea yeah? against the idea of the wall within the wall within the wall, or if you have one continuous space leading into one larger. So this is then the, the, the Romans, of course, as you can imagine, the Romans were fed up, you know. They thought we have to put some, some Roman temples in the middle of the, of the Greek Agora, okay? Now, what also emerged the first time with the Greek is the abstraction of the grid. And you can see, usually the grid refers to the idea of the Roman city, Roman city because the Islamic or the fire, or the, the Asians had a grid, yeah? Uh, but, um, 
let's say the Far East city, or which is called, later called and later called in the Islamic city, of course, was just based on a building next to a building next to a building next to a building next to a building, and had therefore an amorphic pattern. Yeah, but what is now what happened with the Greek city because of the idea of the polis? Yeah, so that means that each time when there was let's say more than twenty to forty thousand people, and the Greeks wanted to make a new polis, yeah, they had to make a new settlement, and for the new settlement, this is the Millet, could, you could um, the first, um, uh, I think one of the first new Greek city, there was the idea that they had to make a grid, yeah? but the grid was still within the boundary of, of a wall. Yeah? And so here, for, for example, you see that the first time all these spaces, the public references were within, embedded within the grid, you know, differently than, uh, than Athens, because Athens grew historically. Yeah? Then, there was one type of house that you could see crossed over, you could say, all, um, uh, so the, 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 the housing type the, um, that was used for uh, living basically was the same throughout the whole uh, region from the Far East to even to, uh, uh, to, to the days Morocco, and that was basically the courtyard house. Yeah? It's a very interesting type because you see, it has nothing to do with a window. There was no thing to the outside. It was just a wall, and the only thing is, it only had, the idea of window didn't know, didn't exist yet. It was only re references to an interior space. Yeah? And so here, for example, uh, I always like this diagram because. Because for the Greek, the grid yeah, was not just a grid like for the Romans, where you can ride with your horses, you know, and get da da da, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Asterix, you know, Obelix. For the Greek, uh, the the grid was basically they put the grid on a mountain, yeah, independently of the topography, yeah. So you see here, this is good for the roller skaters, you know, you can start horizontally and then you jump down the staircases, yeah, you know, with yeah. So this is the, 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 the Greek, you know, basically had a more excitement, you know, was kind of urban, urban weirdos. Huh? Not, so, because the Romans, they basically stole everything from the Greek, but then they invented everything new. So this is then already, so the, there's this idea of the city within a couple of mountains, yeah? So as you can see, it was a wall, but it had already uh, the little, little hills inside. And then what is now totally changing, as you can see here, the Greek basically, had, the Romans had the opposite idea of space. So instead of having the single object floating in a landscape, yeah, the, the Greek suddenly had the enclosed building within a context environment. And you can see it in the Agora. So when the Greek Agora was basically single uh, buildings in landscape, the Roman Agora was that architecture made the public space. Hmm. And Joe, you will see later on, I have nothing to draw, but if I would have something to draw, these are the two formal diagrams that go throughout the whole history of architecture. One is the floating figure somewhere on a piece of land, and the other one was architecture makes basically. Yeah, the public space as figure. Yeah, I know you don't understand. You when to, it, basically, these are the two diagrams yeah, that I can draw later on. But these are the two formal diagrams. One time the building is the figure in a floating landscape. This is the Acropolis, and the other time is the figure is the public. Sp I don't know. My my thing doesn't work. I just hope once that Apple is as smart as. No. Uh, uh, as as Microsoft, yeah, and then I can also have my pen where I can draw. Yeah, I'm totally jealous. Yeah, so I would like to draw, but I cannot uh, draw. Yeah, so what? But you could see that the figure is now the public space, and architecture is basically the ground. Yeah. So. Now, what is also funny with the Romans, they were the first capitalists, yeah? They invented yeah, the first idea of slavery, what you are now doing, yeah? To rent the payment of money for the other one who gets rich, yeah? Uh, That's what the Romans did, and they had a new type. They not only had the Domus house, which was the house for the single family, they invented the first idea of, uh, you could say, 
as, um, how do you call this? Um, rentable housing, it was called the Insule, yeah? It was already a five-story high or six-story high building. You see, you would have one of these stupid spaces, BA, you know, one of these, yeah? No air, you would pay a lot of money and all the shit you just dumped down on the road, yeah? yeah? Yeah, and that's how it looked like. Yeah, and there was one someone who owns that house. Hopefully, us in the future. Yeah, and then we would collect the cash, yeah? and then uh, we would get richer. Anyhow, so in the Roman idea, there is already the city of capitalism emerging. Yeah, where basically there comes a new typology which you could call collective housing, and who and the the people that are experts in Aldo Rossi, that's where the idea of the urban villa. Yeah. The collective uh, in certain you know, comes from. So the idea of insole had the same diagram as the coined house, but it was slightly different. Then the Romans are responsible for the grid, but as you know, it was in a certain way an agricultural grid. Yeah? Uh, just to know, this is the idea why you suddenly know why the American landscape looks like this. Yeah? Yeah? And of course, they were famous for their roads. Now, what now the Romans did the first time is because they were the first time who not only copied the city, but they had a territory to which the law becomes a Roman law once you basically place the city. They made a millions, I mean, there was only two moments in the history of Europe that you would find new kind of cities. It's either a Roman fortress or a Middle Age city. Yeah? So these were then the ideas how these Middle Age cities were built. They were basically done somewhere where these two, where the diagram again comes together, where you had uh, two lines of infrastructure, and around this line of infrastructure would be the wall. And this became then the Roman, the Roman diagram of the of the grid or of the idea of the uh, fortress. Um, and one of the nicest examples is basically this uh, dim guard in Algeria where you basically can see the grid and all the, the temples within. So then we come to the Islamic city. I think something we already saw before in Uruk, Uruk where you suddenly see here that the, the, um, the wall basically became uh, uh, the, what you could call the, the collective space in here for the, for the idea of the moshee. But as you can see in difference to the Greek city, there is no road. I mean, the road is leading to the Moshe, but you have to go through a wall into that space. Yeah? So it's not a continuity of this diagram. And then you have a completely other fabric. So here you can see one of these uh, uh, fabrics, I don't know, probably it's in Isfahan, or somewhere in, in Persia or in, in Iran or yeah, somewhere, uh, where you suddenly see that the only rule that sort of accumulates is the relationship between one house to the next, so there is no something like an over-organized grid. Yeah? And I think this has a lot to do because of a different understanding of the collective in relationship to the family as such. So just know, I, I cannot go into that, but I think all of these uh, forms have, of course, to do with a material transformation in the society. Huh? So here you can see. And what is really interesting that you find suddenly not anymore the representation uh, of figures, but you find only geographical patterns. So now the really second radical shift. So when you when you say the first radical shift was with the ice tide, uh, which uh, uh, age time, yeah, where you see suddenly the emergence of uh, uh, the cities of the Far East, uh, the Egyptians and the Romans with the big emperor. Then you had the cities of a new idea of collective, which was the Romans and the Islamic city, yeah? which produced another idea of, uh, of not only religion, but another idea of collection. Then you could say the next radical changes happened in the Middle Ages. Now what happened now in the Middle Ages were the following. A new form of uh, changes happened in the agricultural means. Yeah? Uh, I think the in, there were three ideas of in innovation. One innovation was that you had new pr production mechanisms. So basically that you could, uh, um, how, how do you say, I don't even know the English word. Uh, basically you had something like a, uh, a machine that allowed you to open up the earth. Yeah? Yeah, basically you had this kind of uh, plow. Yeah, plow yeah. Then what you also had is 
you could harvest two to three times a year, not only one times a year. So basically, when you grew something the first, the first time, you could regrow it. So there was an idea, and there was also already uh, understanding uh, of kind of uh, uh, manipulation of the uh, of the seeds. Yeah, which seeds are growing better, and so on. So what happened now? You have to imagine is this. And this is, I think, very unique to Europe. I don't know if it's happened somewhere else. The country in that time was owned by an emperor, okay? The emperor was owning a country. But since there were so many people that had no uh, work anymore because they didn't need anymore to work on the countryside, there became a very strange idea, and that is the people became free from the emperor, because you have to mean you're not anymore owned by the emperor. Uh, this is always the story when I ask you uh, the reason why the Egyptian could have pyramids, you know, 100 by 100 meter, because the pharaoh said, 30,000 people, can you please help me for the, next, <laughs> for the next 25 years to put one stone after one because I want to be buried nicely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, I mean, just know. Yeah, uh, so if you own basically the labor, hmm, I mean, basically, people, of course, were not owned. They thought like Pharaoh is the king of the sun, you know. But anyhow, but in the, but what happened in the Middle Ages, uh, which were basically a time where people were just running around stupidly with a cross, yeah. The moment what happened is that these people became free, and so there came a very strange deal. There came the deal where the people said. We want to become free people, yeah. But you allow us, therefore, yeah, to basically found our own cities, yeah. And so what happened now is that the people moved and founded the city. I think it's Frankfurt. I mean, all the cities that you find, Frankfurt, all the people, all the cities were founded in the Middle Ages by the idea that basically you became a citizen or what you could call a free citizen, yeah? which means you were not anymore owned by the emperor, but you could explore your own life. And what happened now is that the only way that these people could survive was because of trade through artwork. Yeah? So what happened now is that's when the period became where people became all kind of professions. Yeah, every every profession that we think today, the profession of the timber man, the profession of every profession emerged in that case, and and that's what came then 500 years, you could say, of art being the center of that. And so what you could see is a gigantic explosion, you could say, of cities. Yeah in which the city only could survive because it suddenly traded yeah, their goods that they produced. And these goods were not anymore goods by land, but these goods were basically goods of trade. This is where you could say the idea, not only of capitalism, but the idea of an enormously amount of growth of money came. So here does now how this how the city looked like. It became now a very strange mixture of representation of powers. So there was, uh, in principle, and this is why the Middle Age city is a very powerful organism. Yeah, it consists. It, it, it survived uh, around 500 years. And if you look, if you look even today, when people were looking for new social models for cities, they still refer to the Middle Age because in the Middle Age, you had five different equally same represented classes, the religious class, the, uh, the traders, the uh, craftsmanship, the farmers, and the... Uh, yeah, Ritters, yeah, Ritters, or something like this, yeah? Ah, knights, yeah. So, and, and I think there were the knights, there were the... There were the, the the trade people, there were religious people, there were really religious people, and there were the hand craft, hand craft, yeah? And they were equally, you see, they were equally powerful, yeah? And that's why you see uh, all these kind of assemblies. Oh, this is my favorite, yeah? And as you can see, they didn't know what to do. 
they just took over the Roman fortress, you know, and just built a city into the fortress. So there was a bit, so this is, for example, Al. It is not a new design thing. It was a Roman leftover building, and it just transformed it. Yeah, or for example, this is for my friend from, oh yeah, you're from Serbia, but for my friend from, from Croatia. This is the Diocletian palace. So this was the palace on the right side from the Romans, and then they basically made a middle aged city out of the palace. Huh? Huh? This is my triple O of history, you know? Yeah, the, the re origination of an, of an object. Yeah? This is what you can see. It became all these amorphic forms because as more people came to the city, they just expanded it very similar to the Islamic city, just expanded it. And here you can see the representation of the power. And as its representation, it became suddenly the Roman idea, yeah? of the collective space. And as you can see, all the roads were leading to this Piazza uh, del um, Campo in Siena. Mm. And what you can see is the middle Age city was similar to the others. It was, in principle, nothing else is enclosed yeah, from the surrounding. Here, for example, Venice yeah, by water, or let's say Brugge from Belgium you know, as a circle. Yeah. And then there were some new ones, for example, this one. These were um, uh, done by, by the English, yeah. Uh, no, it was by the French or English. I thought it was by the English after they conquered some parts of France, yeah, because they had to make new land, yeah. yeah. Then you could say the Italian city was actually very bad for the city because the city in the Renaissance didn't grow, it had no idea, but it was the arrangement of reorganizing the city. And as you know, it was the moment where the perspectival idea came, where the subjective view came. This is the Brunelleschi uh, cupola where the Renaissance emerged. And what the only really program was is that suddenly the city became you could say the middle age city became ordered or became an organized principle. Yeah? And as you can see, that organized principle emerged through the idea of the perspective, through the idea of the grid, and through a certain kind of manifesto on, the, on the things like Alberti, where suddenly the grid yeah, became the manifestation of this device. And what you can see, for example, is, is not only that these were the moments when the most architectural thoughts emerged, but you can see that, for example, in the idea of the church, yeah, where, for example, this is the most fam uh, this is a famous uh, uh, Santa Spirito by Brunelleschi, where the first time the church yeah, was nothing else as a reproduction of a square element reproduced used as an organized grid. This is when, when Alberti then spoke about the idea of the homogeneous space, things where Eisenman started to say, is the first time that there is an organized space, yeah, the grid space emerging instead of the uh, uh, space that just accumulated. So what you see in the Renaissance is the immersion of geometry and the means of the abstraction and the idea of the ideal city. The only really project that happened at that moment, it's already, it leads already towards the Baroque, yeah, was the first time the idea that to cut the city with straight lines yeah, and connect the monuments of it. Yeah? And the most famous, this is uh, via uh, Julia in Rome, but the most famous project is that plan from Sixtus V. You can see it's the prototype of many Baroque cities, but it's also the prototype of Hausmann. Yeah? It's the first time where the city is not grown anymore as a pattern, but where you basically just cut lines yeah, into the urban fabric and connect suddenly the ideas of, mo of monuments. Be, so why, why this is interesting is this, because it's the first time that circulation, yeah, so the space of movement, yeah, becomes the first time articulated. And so here, for example, this plan of the Sixus, he just draws lines, you see, and they, this becomes a pattern of network. Yeah? Uh, that becomes the first time an urban fabric. So now uh, you have to imagine something else changed. And this is around the 17th century and 18th century. Because of the millions of trade, and then you had the religious war in Europe, yeah? And then you had the problem that the question was, how does Europe become reorganized? You, you see the emergence of the nation state, yeah? 
Now the nation state yeah, was suddenly something which of course was related to the big emperors, let's say uh, 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 the son, uh, the uh, Ludwig the the Fourteenth, uh, the, uh, the Dutch, uh, the Austrians, and so on. But what was now important is this: because of that enormously amount of trade, yeah, one city became more important than the others, and that city became, which is called the capital city. And I always like to argue it because in English the word capital yeah, is not only the main city, it also means it's there where the money is located. And so you can see it's, the, it's already the beginning of the emergence of capitalism, yeah? but in principle in that sense is a, is a main city that is, becomes distinguished from all the other cities of the Middle Ages, yeah? and that becomes what we know today, Paris, Vienna, Amsterdam, London, uh, Milan, Rome, and so on. Yeah? So these become the major cities, yeah? but actually it becomes the cities of the agglomerate capital. And what you can see is, you can see there is a new kind of representation of power. There is a new emergent of public space. The public space of the monument or the public space of collective memory. Because what you see suddenly here, and this is a space uh, um, uh, uh, Blas uh, Voyage in, 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 uh, in uh, Paris, what you can see suddenly is what is in the middle yeah, is not anymore a market or a trade. What is in the middle is a representation of a monument of collective memory that belongs to the whole nation. Yeah? So there comes now this idea that the architecture turns into a collective monument and uh, the citizen around it. And so here you can see all this kind of emergent of uh, uh, monumental space in Paris. It's also interesting in terms of architectural theory when the, let's say, you could say in historical terms, if the beginning of the city was based more or less in the Middle East, then it shifted the power towards the Greek, then they shifted the power to the Romans, then it shifted the power to the Islamic city, yeah? then the power came back to Italy, then the power came back to France, yeah? And then what you can see from France, it then moved to London, yeah, and then the, to the US. Yeah, and so you can see that's what it, the shift in the economy is, is then also a shift in the form of the city. So here uh, is then uh, Paris. What is, what is interesting now is the city became the first time also copied, yeah, but so the emperor copied basically a city for himself, yeah, because he, don't, he didn't want to live with these stupid people from the Middle Ages, yeah, who were just throwing down the shit, you know, on the road, yeah. So he made the same size for himself, and this is why you, why you all like to travel now to, uh, to Versailles and Schönbrunn, yeah. It has the same size as the Middle Age, yeah, but it was only from one guy, yeah. And the, and the rest was living in the in the dump. Huh? And so here you can see a nice example of Vienna. So this was the city of Vienna of the Middle Age, and these are now, you know, the Prince, uh, the Belvedere, uh, the Schönbrunn on the right side, and the Belvedere on the other. Interesting enough, if you look at the Baroque city in Italy, of course it was nothing else as the Roman have just grown their grid. Yeah? So here you see a very nice example from the Turin, which was a Roman fortress, but during the Middle Ages it became just an explosion of the grid. Or the first kind of, and this is, you could say, people argue it, it's the first kind of the capitalist, the first kind of capitalist plan. This was Amsterdam, yeah? Because Amsterdam, the reason why people say, oh, Amsterdam, these cool guys, you know, you know, jointy, smoky, you know, yeah? Because the Am Amsterdam was the only city that was not run by a king. It was a city that was run by only entrepreneurs, yeah? Because they made just gigantic a lot of money, yeah? By sort of trading to India and you know and getting all the money from Indonesia, you know, and, yeah? don't trust the Dutch. Yeah, uh, <laughs> one friend of mine told me the only reason why the Dutch are against the war is because it makes better money if there's no war. Huh? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, but what is interesting on their plan, this is the first plan, and this is a Baroque plan, Amsterdam, which is the first plan that is not anymore a plan of the representation of power, is the first capitalist plan. So what they have done is they made these three rings, they subdivided these rings into these pieces of land, and it was the first time that you could buy and sell land. So here comes the first shift, when in the Middle Ages, you were not allowed to lose any land, yeah? because the land still belonged to the emperor. You were, you were only a free person. What happened with is that more and more people became more richer, and these people demanded to suddenly own land. And that is what is our current understanding of capitalism, is the moment when you not only were owning a piece of house, you are also owning a piece of land. And that's just, you know, is the whole idea of the American, uh, American Constitution, which basically is you have the right of your own property. Yeah? And that's why in Europe it's still a belief in a collective, because as you can imagine, in order for you to have this land, you need the collective infrastructure for that land to be a, actually exploitable. Yeah? But anyhow, this is what I wanted to say. Uh, it's important to understand that the, the Dutch are the first, you could say, capitalist land plan in which you could buy and sell land. And the only reason why the English have such a thing as a grid is only because it burned down, you know, and they put a grid. But actually, the English are the ones that never wanted to come out from the Middle Ages. Yeah, yeah. They, they always wanted to live in a village, in a village, in a village, in a village, until the Russians and the Chinese came. Yeah. So now, the last 20 years, there was so much money that now you see, bam, 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 bam. Yeah, the high rise. Yeah. So the English, uh, the villages are going to disappear. As you know, pre-exit, some village people want to well, to get the village back, yeah? Became for them too much, yeah? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I hope they die. <laughs> so now, that was the, so when this was still the, uh, the moment that you could say the cities grew historically, parallel to that, they, they started then uh, to our poor little friends from South America, the idea of colonization. So what you can suddenly see is that, the con uh, of course, uh, the, the conquering of the religion uh, um, in uh, uh, America, uh, and uh, by America I mean North and South America, uh, what happened was, is suddenly for that new territory, there came, a new, uh, there came a new idea how to make new cities, and that was the idea of the grid. Yeah? But as you can see, here comes now the grid, in a Greek style, yeah? So the Agora is back as a piazza, yeah? But it's still within a grid of the Roman fortress. And remember, the Roman fortress would still be a circulation space in the middle, but now you suddenly had a, a, a public space in the middle, yeah? Anyhow, and that's why you can see now, uh, this is a famous one, yeah? the Sokola in, in uh, Mexico City, where they sort of suicidaled an Austrian guy yeah? called Maximilian III, just cut the head off. Or Ecuador and uh, Guadalajara. Yeah? But also, it became the first city of the United States, like Savannah, and you can see already in Savannah, there is an idea that is slightly off in comparison to all these others. Even when you look at here very precisely, you find here a lot of churches distributed, but in the idea of the Savannah, you see a grid, but the grid is organized in terms of watts, and these watts could be understood as little neighborhoods, yeah, or kind of little units, yeah, that became multiple. I mean, I'm saying this only because if you once have been in, in the U.S., since there is no state, yeah, and you only have the family, yeah, the, the, lay, the social layer in between is actually the neighborhood, yeah? This is where uh, the community is arised. So here, famous plan, of course, from Philadelphia, and an even more famous plan from Manhattan, which then became the real uh, capitalist city of the 19th century. Yeah? Now, what it means by capitalist city is this. It means that suddenly the owning of the land was a property that you could be sold and traded. So 
With the emergence of the industrialization and the emergence of a new kind of material changes yeah, in terms of uh, the industry, a new city emerged, and that is the city, what you call the metropolitan city of the 19th century, and, and Manhattan is probably the prototype of that. I'm showing that because usually if you think about US, you would find actually this grid, yeah? and this is the idea of the Jeffersonian grid. But I show it to you because the Jeffersonian grid has nothing to do with the Manhattan grid, because the Manhattan grid is an urban grid, and the Jeffersonian grid is an agricultural grid. Yeah? So if you see, for example, today, a kind of landscape or a kind of single family houses in the middle in Phoenix, Arizona, that is mostly a grid that was before agriculture and then turned into um, um, urban. So with this, you become a new city emerges, and that's the city of the industrial revolution, or the, you could say the liberal city. Yeah? Now, what happened now with the liberal city was that a new species emerged. This was the entrepreneur, yeah? the, the people that had the money, and for that money, basically, you needed this, the city. So two things happened. The industrialization changed from the people that were before. I mean, here comes the little Marxist theory. So when in the Middle Age you were a craftsman yeah, or a craftswoman or whatever you want to call it, you were in, you owned the means of production. That means you owned your own uh, uh, means with which you did your furnitures, with which you did your thing. So with the industrialization, what happened is you changed, you gave away the means, the, the, how to say, the, the tools with which you produce and you become labor, okay? So you, you gave away what you, how you do things, but you got instead back uh, salary and labor, yeah? And the factory man or the factory owner, he became the owner of the means of production. And so therefore you get all the whole idea of the market theory, okay? If I do now a product, yeah, and I put all the stuff in a the product, there is a more value to the product in relationship to all the stuff that goes in. And the question is, who should get that more value? Yeah? And that's split it between, you could say, capitalism and communism, because communism said, you know, it should be us, the worker, and the capitalist said, no, it should become into entrepreneur. But the whole idea of the, the, the redistribution of wealth became a problem, who should get the more value, yeah? Of, uh, of the product. But what had happened to cities was the city exploded. Uh, if you imagine, until the 18th century, Paris had, I don't know, 400 or 500,000 people. Yeah. Suddenly, in the end, it had 3 million or 4 million. Vienna had 200,000, had suddenly 2.2 million. You know, and so you could say within 100 years, the city exploded. And with the explosion, you suddenly got all this gigantic amount of poor people. Yeah? And so just to know the kind of idea or the kind of stuff that I saw happening, for example, in China in the last 25 years, or things that I saw happening in India, in, in principle, the, the, through the means of money, there was an enormous attraction into the city. And with the amount of attraction of the city, there became a question of how to restructure it. That became the moment where, of course, the, the, in the end of the uh, 19th century, the question became how do you deal with all the kind of poor slums that were happening in all these cities because of this gigantic uh, um, let's say, excess. So what you have is suddenly the emergence of the socialists, yeah? A new political party emerges, the people that represented more or less the worker, and so you get all these kind of utopian projects, let's say, for example, here, the, the, the idea, the uh, Owen's idea of harmony in India, you know, or the very famous Falas Dea by Foyer, which were suddenly utopian social projects for new kind of living uh, style. And, and I think one of them is built in Gouze. Is, I think it's called Familiaris Dea. And the idea is, it was the first communist idea that you take care about the children together, you live there uh, as a community. And here, for example, the idea of the kindergarten, yeah? I mean, the collective, the collective takeover instead of the family. Yeah? 
So the post-liberal city, it's basically, you could say, the end of the 19th century, is a city where people realized we have to do something and government, the government suddenly played a gigantic role. So you have to imagine when before the city was run only by private entrepreneurs, yeah? Private entrepreneurs suddenly realized we have to do something for the workers, and that's why you see enormously a lot of these social uh, settlements emerging. But what is really emerging is that what we today is the city that you all like so much, you know, is the Paris of Hausmann yeah, and the Vienna of the Ringstraße. Yeah, because what happened now, because Napoleon was not anymore, you know, trying to. You know, because the Russians just threw Napoleon back to Napoleon, yeah? What happened was basically the city was able to open its boundary and there was a reorganization of the infrastructure of the city. So that was the moment when the city became more or less, and this was called post-liberal city, the city started to buy back the infrastructure of the entrepreneurs. Now, why I'm telling you why this is crazy and why people would say that what we, we experience today in a neoliberal world is something similar to in the 19th century is because, for example, many German cities have, for example, sold their infrastructure to American stock markets. Yeah? But you know, if you want to sell your infrastructure, you're not anymore in control of your city. Yeah? So this was already something that happened in the 19th century, which meant basically that the city municipality realized if we want to be in control of our city, we have to at least own the infrastructure. And that's why you see the emergence of sewage system, metro, uh, things, but owned not by private companies, but owned by the cities. Yeah? And I think this is a very interesting uh, thing to understand. So that's why you see, basically, the most famous project is the Hausmann Street. Yeah, you see, if suddenly a regulation of Hausmann, and so here you see, for example, the demolition. Yeah, to make uh, uh, basically a new. Uh, you could also say political space, but by demolishing it, you are also building the infrastructure of it. Yeah? So just to know, for, uh, this is what the argument is, For of course, in a lot of Chinese cities, you produce another standard of living, of course, but that standard of living is mostly not anymore in the city center. So all these bul boulevards become, on the one hand side, a new public space for that new bourgeoisie, but at the same time it became a new infrastructure of the city at large. So that's then, today it's a kind of romanticized Paris, but in the 19th century it was just purely uh, a street for making Paris livable yeah, within uh, the investment in public infrastructure. And then you, uh, a new house emerged that's similar to the Greek, this is the similar to the insule from the Romans, yeah? It's called the Zins house, yeah? Or the, the rent house. And, in, and so the house in itself became a social strata, yeah? Because depending on the, on the amount of, of uh, uh, where you were living, basically the rent was either higher or lower, yeah? And so this is a kind of interesting social space. But also what emerged is the first kind of commercial interiority, uh, the kind of first kind of commercial space, yeah, which is called the passage of work, yeah, which is the beginning of the, sh the idea of the shopping mall. Yeah? So with this kind of new money, you see a new space emerging that is not anymore the piazza, there's not any more, it's similar to the bazaar in a certain way, because you could say the bazaar is an in interior, but that is became the first time the commercialized interior space. Now, the, the most interesting plan, I would argue, uh, that emerged as um, as the restructuring is this uh, plan from Sierra from Barcelona, and you see it very nicely. Here was the middle aged city, and then the only thing what uh, then uh, expanded was the idea of the grid. So if you would draw now, until now, a diagram, we could say the first city was the city of the circle, which is the one that was the thing, and then you had the city of the grid. 
And with the modern city, which is in principle the city that then was taken over by the means of mass production and a mass uh, for the, uh, 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 Fordism, yeah, a new kind, we could say, um, diagram emerged, and that was, for example, the high-rise tower. Hmm? Because what suddenly happened was that the demand of the architecture buildings yeah, to become sustainable within the lifestyle and the money of the city, it needed to be suddenly vertical. And so what people describe now is the shifts now the diagram, yeah, this comes now the shift of the diagram, where the interiority of the building over demands the exteriority. Yeah. Yeah? And that means the building had to turn into a freestanding building. Yeah? So here comes what I said before, suddenly the Greek took over over the Romans, yeah? because modernism mean, meant the building became suddenly a freestanding building like the Acropolis. Yeah? Because as you see, in, if you look in Paris, every building was still connected to every other building. Yeah? They were, the building was not freestanding, but with modernism, the new demand emerged, and that is that the reproduction of the building by means of uh, industrial production, like say, for example, here, the Corbusier plan, the building had to become freestanding. So a, a totally new diagram emerges, and that's the diagram of the archipelago. It was the idea of the island of the single tower. As you can see, that also links always together with the socialist city, yeah? Because in order to produce the city, you needed a lot of money. And that money was not anymore the entrepreneur, that money was the city as such. And this is when I ask you, uh, guys, when we meet us in two weeks, yeah? I wanted to show you that kind of social archipelago, which is the idea of the seed loan, yeah? One of them is very famous here in, uh, in, in, in Frankfurt, yeah? And if you want, we can show there, which means where the city suddenly yeah, produces this kind of archipelagos yeah, uh, of islands. Yeah? But in order to understand that, it had to do with a completely new diagram, and that was the diagram of Le Corbusier, because it only could emerge because the interiority, the internal organization, overtook the problem of the external space. So the public space disappeared, yeah, but the, the freestanding building emerged. Yeah? Because you can imagine when a freestanding building emerged, like here in Le Corbusier, there was no square anymore in between, there was no piazza, there was just space in between. But space had no form. Yeah? Okay. So then, like we say, you know, and then ba ba ba. So that's where the idea came: the city as the building as a city. So the building suddenly took the form of the city, and this is the uh, unité de habitation, you know, with the roof, the garden, you know, underneath, lifted off the ground. It became an autonomous object, yeah, uh, within the endless. Landscape, and this is the famous diagram of Le Corbusier, where you suddenly see the building has lost the urban fabric and became a freestanding object in the middle of a, la of a landscape. In Germany, it was because this was the French model, which was the, the model that basically was a, a slab. But in Germany, there was another guy, he was in Frankfurt, this was called uh, Ernst May, and Ernst May, uh, with the idea of the Bauhaus. Uh, um, dealt with the idea of making now every piece of furniture yeah, to become a mass product piece. Yeah? And so here there came the revolution of social housing and this is the, the one that uh, is in Frankfurt. So what happens in Frankfurt is if you see the middle the middle age city, then the 19th century, and you see all these red dots and these are becoming these Siedlungen. Yeah? which are suddenly produced by collective money. That's how it looks like. It's not a Nazi camp, yeah? It's social housing, yeah? Uh, just no, it's not far away, yeah? It's both for people, yeah? It just, just no, it looks the same, but you just change the content. Yeah? Content is exchangeable. Yeah? But as you can see, it's very interesting. 
it also needed to be a freestanding building. You see, it's the same diagram as Le Corbusier, but in Le Corbusier had a tower, but the Germans invented the idea of the slab. Yeah? These are usually raw houses, but as you can see, since it was necessary to have for every worker the same standardized space, yeah, it needed to basically produce, uh, uh, it, it, it lost the idea of the block, you know, it became a single standing object. Yeah? I think we should look in one of these. Now, as you know, the Austrians did the same thing, but they gave a damn shit about how it looks like. So what they did is for the workers, if the king could live in a big castle, then our workers are going to live in a big castle. So that's why the Viennese have done for the workers a 900 meter long copy yeah, of the Schlossenbrunn yeah, and said proletarian should also live in palaces. Yeah? Uh, but you can see it's a totally different form because, and this is why Aldo Rossi and all these Italians were so interested, yeah, because even when this was the same ideology, it changed the form because the form was a historical courtyard and not a new monument. So these are the Viennese diagram. Probably the real, real last innovation that happened in capitalism was the garden city. Now, the Garden City is probably the most depressive idea of capitalism, yeah? but it's very important that you understand. The Garden City was the, has nothing to do with garden. It has nothing to do. The question was, what's the alternative within capitalism? Yeah? Is another form of city possible? Mm -hmm. And the Garden City was the idea that what if... I take a lot of investors yeah, and we buy a piece of agricultural land that is very cheap. Yeah? But then on this agricultural land, we then build yeah, a new city and the people that are going to live there don't pay the rent to the capitalists like in the city, but basically pay back a mortgage yeah, of the rent of the people. Yeah? And this is the, mo the first time the model I don't know if I'm totally right, probably historically it is what you could call collective uh, property or no, um, I don't know, no, corporate, corporate, uh, uh, I don't know how you say it in English, uh, I think it's called corporate ownership, yeah, because the idea suddenly was instead of one person owning the piece of land and the other one renting, what you do is you buy the piece of land yeah, as, a, as a collective, yeah, and what you pay back is the idea of a rent. Now, this became the model of what we call today, I think it's nearly dying out, but which is called the welfare state idea of housing, yeah, that a housing corporation yeah, you know, invests into a house and what you buy back is basically the rent. Yeah? Now, here you can see why the model was working. It was an idea within capitalism, yeah, which means within the free market. Now, you can learn a lot if you want to get very rich. Yeah, you know what you have to do? Buy a piece of agricultural land and then turn it into beautiful land and you from one day to the next never have to work. Yeah? The most beautiful example is in China called the village in the city. This is really hilarious. The Chinese have done something very interesting because Mao yeah, was so scared that the farmers are freaking out. Yeah? So what he did is he basically allowed the farmers to own the land. Okay? For a communist, something completely weird yeah? because you were suddenly allowing to own the land. Now, through this gigantic explosion of the last 25 years, yeah, where the Chinese just grew their cities, some of the farmers, you know, suddenly landed in the middle of the city, yeah, Shenzhen, you know, yeah, and they said, like, holy yo, from nothing it became suddenly worth I don't know what, yeah. So there's a really hilarious story where these farmers from one day to the became, you know, capitalists, you know, and just playing games. Of course, someone, uh, there, there are also uh, um, tragic stories, yeah, but some of them became completely famous. But, but the idea is the same, because once you own it, yeah, and it turns from agriculture 
to billable land, the, the money goes high. Like some nail house in China. What is nail house? Nail house, like the house that is, is like that same thing, like around by agriculture, but it's in the city, like it's in the status of the Yeah, yeah, in principle, it's the same thing. Yeah. The mo the, what you have to understand why it's a crazy story is because. Um, it because because it has to do with the ownership of land. If the if the farmers wouldn't own the land, yeah, it would be worthless. Yeah, but since they since they owned it, they had a right to explore it. Yeah. But I mean, the garden city is just the idea that you understand this. This was a now why? And here comes the nostalgia. If you look exactly into the diagram, it says it's the relationship. So to find what is good on the countryside and what is good in the town, yeah, and how to connect it. But as you can see already, when you look at the diagram, yeah, you will find a very similarity to the Middle Ages, and you find a very similarity to the Greek in the previous city, because the ideal of that city was suddenly the idea of a certain kind of community. And since this guy, Howard Ebenezer, was an English Protestant, yeah, the idea of the community was a religious idea of the Middle Age community. Yeah? And that's why you, when the first kind of uh, Latchworth city was built, you can see in the middle, there is this little collective green. Yeah? And here you can see, and this is why I'm always saying London is a big, uh, big village, yeah? because London, London became then this idea of all these archipelagos of cities, of garden cities, exploded outside. And that became then the reconstruction of London after the Second World War. And this became this idea of the garden city modernist uh, project that you can still find uh, throughout all Europe, where suddenly you make this little kind of village. I'm always showing sometimes originals, yeah? So this is rendering from the 1950s, yeah? That looks cool, huh? Eh? Yeah, rendering from the 1950s. So, and so this was the idea that you reproduce a kind of village, yeah? Outside of the countryside in terms of socialist housing project. So the end of modernism, and this is the beginning of our lecture series, yeah? is in principle the, the project of the 60s and the 70s. Yeah? And what you can see is, this is the project which you call today megastructures uh, and so on. What they were is these were architects that were either trained by modernists, either worked for Le Corbusier, yeah? and they tried to make the modernism look better. Yeah? And what they did, and this is the socialist city of the, or, I mean, uh, what they did is now, they tried to take the form of modernist slabs, so the, the architecture stayed the same, yeah? But then they linked it to a new idea of public infrastructure, and that is, for example, a project by Van der Broek and Bagama in Amsterdam, uh, where you can see suddenly a new road, yeah? That goes to Amsterdam, and you try to link all these people related to this road. And the last image what I want to show you is, and this is where um, probably I want to end and where all these lectures that are now coming starts is, when you look now at the whole history that I showed you, then you could argue, and Lefebvre did a very interesting reading of that, you could say that in the beginning of our urban, of our urban culture, we were all living on the countryside. Basically, we were all living on an agricultural, we were actually farmers, okay? And the whole last 5,000 year is actually a history of urbanization. It started with the Greek, then it went to the, uh, or it started with the Middle East, it went into the Greek, yeah? It went into the Middle Ages, to the Renaissance, to the 19th century. And what we happen today, and this is what Toxiades, it's a kind of a little bit a weird hypothesis that Toxiades, Toxiades did in the in the 50s, I think, yeah? But what his idea was, and this is what Lefebvre said, is we are going towards a, a global world in which 100% of us are going to live in an urban environment, yeah? And I would say, it sounds kind of strange, but what you, ha what you have happened, what happened to me now with the election in London, yeah? And the election in, in the United Nations, yes, 
as you could see, to me, these are the last nostalgia of the countryside, yeah? fearing that it's going to take over in terms of urbanization. I mean, you see, it's a, it's an, it's an countryside revolution, yeah. yeah? And uh, as you know, there was a map I think um, that came out a couple of years ago, yeah, where you could see that uh, 1910 or 1907, 10% of the world population was living in an urban environment, yeah. 2007, 50%, and in 2075, uh, I think 2000, whatever, what, 75% of the of the world population is living in a city. Yeah, and so all the kind of aid projects that are all books that we are going to experience now in the next lecture series have to do. What does it mean suddenly when we live in a totally urbanized world? Yeah. And that's a little bit sort of was my little history to you. Yeah? That we, what started with a pure agricultural revolution turned into a pure urban revolution. Yeah? And that's sort of going to show in the next eight or so lectures, you know, every evening one, where we then we discussed one architect who looks to that idea of urbanization and looked at it, what it means to architecture. I hope we survived. I was a little bit fast, you know, but therefore we can go and have dinner now. Huh? Thank you.